terror in Pakistan. A deadly attack kills dozens of people at a major university. Kenyan authorities kill militants who are planning terrorist attacks. And a special video aimed at changing the minds of radicalized Muslim women in Britain. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. The quiet calm of a college campus suddenly turned violent on Wednesday morning when a gun and a bomb attack erupted on a university in northwestern Pakistan, killing at least 25 people and wounding dozens more. Security forces say a group of 10 to 12 terrorists stormed the Baka Khan University in Chasad Dam and opened fire on students and teachers. At least two suicide bombers were said to be among the terrorists. Uh, four attackers were killed during a gun fight with the Pakistani military forces. A spokesman for the provincial ruling party told reporters that at least 50 people have been taken to nearby hospitals suffering from gunshot wounds. The university is home to more than 3,000 students. A spokesman for the Pakistani Taliban says the group had nothing to do with the attack, declaring it was against Islamic Sharia. <clears throat> Well, Kenyan police say they shot and killed four men Wednesday who were planning to carry out attacks in the country. They killed them during a raid on a property in the coastal town of Malindi. The local police chief says mobile phones, grenades and hand-drawn maps were recovered in the raid and that one of the men killed was on Kenya's most wanted list. Kenyan authorities are circulating pictures of suspected Al-Shabaab terrorists and offered about $20,000 reward for information leading to arrests. Earlier this month, Kenyan police arrested a suspected Al-Shabaab fighter in Mombasa and recovered weapons that had been intended for use in aborted New, Year, New Year's Eve attacks on the coastal city. For an update on the situation, I'm joined on the phone from Kenya by Eric Ponda, a Mombasa-based journalist. Hello, Eric. Hi, how are you, Makori? Fine. Now, start us with uh, what do we know about the nationalities of these men who were killed? Uh, it's not yet clear, but uh, uh, according to the police uh, in Malindi, uh, two of the gunned down uh, terrorists uh, have, been have been identified as uh, Kenyan uh, youth. Uh, one from Malindi, from the same, same area, and one uh, identified as uh, Issa Jabri who has been on the wanted list by the police, uh, by, the, by the Kenyan police. Uh, this one comes from, uh, according to police reports, this one comes from uh, Kisauni, Mombasa. And you, you, you will understand that uh, Mombasa has been uh, uh, one of the greatest hit by this uh, terrorist attack, Sabakori. Yes. Now, Eric, uh, does it also appear that uh, most of those were suspected to be militants who are uh, expect or, or, uh, suspect to be potentially planning attacks would be found around Mombasa and the coastal region? Yeah, yeah it, it's okay. That, that one, because, you know, the, the Mombasa is uh, just, okay, if you put it like this, because according to the proximity between Mombasa or the, the coastal region and the Somalia border, then definitely you can, you can see so, because very many youth have been uh, uh, joining these groups, and uh, it's, it's worrying right, right now because many, many, many of the youth are just uh, living among us. So uh, you, 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 you can just understand the, the, the kind of problem uh, the coastal region is facing right now. To what extent are the communities in the coastal region cooperating with the police, especially when those youth happen to be Kenyan citizens? Uh, since the police uh, uh, gave out the list of those wanted people, you know, many, 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 many parents have been worried because, you know, this is something, uh, especially when you just associate this problem with uh, Al-Shabaab. Many, many parents don't want to come out uh, to say whether they are, they are, they are, they are, they are youth, um, they are, they are, their children are missing or something. But again, uh, it's a problem that uh, the police have, have, has been dealing with. And... Uh, if you remember, recently there are some uh, parents who have been uh, uh, coming forward with their, with their kids or with their children uh, uh, surrendering to the police. So this is a problem which is facing the, the community, and uh, most of the community is not well, well men, well, uh, is not willing to come out uh, to say exactly where the, the, their children is, uh, yeah. where, where their children are. And uh, again, uh, 
if you consider the, 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 the kind of problem uh, the coastal region has been having throughout uh, since this problem of uh, radicalization started, you know, it's a it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a of a great magnitude. So it's not a problem that uh, many people would, would want to associate with, especially the, the parents along the coastal region. Now, you are in Malinda today, you've been to Kilifi, you're in Mombasa. Uh, how is uh, the state of um, uh, security? Do people feel comfortable moving about, doing their businesses, or do people live in fear? There's a lot of tension in, in, right, right now in Malindi, and uh, this, this attack or this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, incident has really uh, uh, brought a lot of fear among the, the, the Malindi residents especially this time when Malindi is preparing for a by-election. Uh, by you remember two days ago, the president, uh, Uru Kinyata, was around there. And now this, 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 this incident has really uh, brought a lot of fear among the, 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 the residents of Malindi. And if you consider Malindi is just a few kilometers from Lamu, where uh, a lot of insecurity has been reported uh, around the Boni Forest just uh, near the, uh, the Somali, the Kenyan Somali border. So right now there's a lot of uh, 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 a lot of tension around around Malindi uh, because of the of, of, of the many many incidents that have been happening just uh, in the near neighboring uh, district of Lamu. Well, Eric, thank you very much. Eric Ponda is a Mombasa-based uh, journalist. Well, not too far from Kenya in the Central Africa Republic, United Nations officials say the crisis in Burundi has the nation on the brink of a new civil war after it emerged from a 12-year ethnically fueled conflict just a decade ago. The UN has documented cases of Burundi's security forces gang raping women during searches of homes owned by opposition supporters. The UN has also heard witness testimony on the location of mass graves. Now, Burundi has suffered through a wave of increased violence since President Pierre Nkurunziza said he would seek a third term, which his opponents say is illegal. Nearly 500 people have been killed in the violence, and some 200,000 have fled the country. UN Deputy Secretary General Jan Eliasson expressed his concerns over the situation. We see uh, very worrying signs on the ground, and uh, also uh, a certain nervousness in Rwanda uh, that uh, also is of concern. What must not happen in Burundi is that this conflict moves from a political phase to an ethnic phase. Uh, when you take that step, then uh, we always pay a price because then there's a new element entering the conflict which will be much more e harder to control. Well, viewers, United Nations correspondent Margaret Bashir interviewed the US UN ambassador Samantha Power and she had this message for the Burundian authorities. Well, the main message is this is a critical crossroads for Burundi. 230,000 people have already been displaced. 400 people have already been killed. We cannot, they cannot let it become business as usual, that you wake up in the morning and there's a corpse on the street as you, as you try to get to work. And that is what is starting to happen in Burundi. Well, Ambassador Power is calling on President Nkurunziza to open himself up to mediation and accept the presence of UN, a UN and international force. Well, British authorities have released a video aimed at potentially radicalized Muslim women in Britain to try to counter propaganda from Islamic State terrorist group. It follows several cases of Muslim women living to join Islamic State in Syria, often taking their families with them. And Ridgewan reports from London. The latest Islamic State propaganda video featuring a young boy with a British accent calling on followers to kill the non-believers. The boy, named as four-year-old Issa Dare, was recognized by his grandfather in London, Sunday Dare, whose daughter Grace traveled to Syria in 2012 and entered an arranged marriage. She posted this photo of Issa on Twitter. What, what's your message to your daughter? She should come back and face the music because she has let herself down. Grace Dare is one of about 50 women who have traveled to Syria to join Islamic State. Such is the concern that British authorities have released this video to counter the ISIS propaganda. We're deeply concerned about the numbers of women, girls and whole families who are making the decision to travel to Syria. They're unaware of the dangers they face when they get there. 
three Syrian refugee mothers spell out those dangers in the video. Your children are now living in security, are provided with schools, a nice life and a beautiful future. Why are you taking them to a war zone? Counterterrorism expert Afzal Ashraf has interviewed many women who have escaped Islamic State territory. Stories of women being forced to divorce their husbands and marry other people. Uh, women being separated from their families, um, women being killed because they didn't conform to the dress code, rape, and all sorts of very horrible things. It's estimated that around 800 British citizens have travelled to join Islamic State. The high number has prompted criticism of the government's so-called prevent strategy aimed at countering radicalisation. To judge the success of government strategies and prevent, what you are doing is trying to measure something that didn't happen. How many people didn't become radicalized, which is really the objective of PREVENT. It's very difficult to measure that. Ashraf says Islamic State's primary recruiting tool has been its success on the battlefield in Iraq and Syria. If you deny it that territory, then you deny it the claim of success, and then you deny the seduction of success. It's hoped recent strategic victories against Islamic State, such as the retaking of the city of Ramadi by Iraqi forces, will diminish the group's territory and its appeal to radicalized Muslims. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, London. Well, Islamic State has finally acknowledged the death of a brutal terrorist nicknamed Jihadi John, known for beheading Western hostages. The site intelligence monitoring website says Islamic State eulogized the killer in its English language magazine. The Pentagon said in November that it was reasonably certain a drone strike in Syria killed Jihadi John. Jihadi John's real name was Mohammed Enwazi, a British citizen of Arab descent. He was known for appearing in videos wearing a black mask over the, his face, denouncing the West uh, before cutting off uh, the heads of hostages, including U.S. journalists and British aid workers. Well, the United States is condemning the deaths and atrocities committed by Islamic State in its campaign of terror in Iraq. A U.S. State Department official com commented on a new United Nations report that says close to 19,000 civilians were killed in Iraq between early 2014 and late 2015, and more than 3 million were displaced as a result of the violence. The terrorist group also is said to hold about 3,500 slaves. Viewers, it's Latisa Hoke reports. UN officials call the figures staggering but say the situation may actually be much worse. The figures are based on information from survivors and witnesses, but many atrocities could not be documented. ISIL in particular has been employing the most gruesome methods uh, to execute people by running bulldozers over them, by burning them alive. Um, in one case, people were put in a cage and the cage was then thrown into the water. People are being murdered uh, for the most obscure of reasons. One imam was killed because he was not praying correctly. There are children who have been abducted by ISIL. We've documented about 800 children who were abducted and then forced to fight, uh, put in religious schools or sent directly to the front lines. Violence does not necessarily stop once an area is reclaimed from Islamic State. Uh, we have also documented uh, violations by pro-government forces. Um, in some cases where people, when people flee ISIL-occupied areas, um, they are then arrested by security forces uh, or they are uh, expelled. The United States could not immediately confirm the death toll from the report, but the State Department spokesman Tuesday said Islamic State atrocities are well known. The depth of ISIL's depravity has already been well documented, and this report continues to show uh, the horrend horrendous methods that ISIL has used to run its campaign of terror. Japan Tuesday announced plans to send additional aid to help refugees fleeing violence in Iraq and Syria. In addition to the aid worth $810 million that we have dispersed for refugees and internally displaced people in Syria and Iraq and for neighboring countries, I would like to announce a plan to provide additional aid of $350 million pending the approval of the necessary budget. Thousands of others fleeing violence in Iraq, Syria and elsewhere are now without shelter in the freezing temperatures as they cross the Balkan countries on the way to Western Europe. Zlarisa Hoke, VOA News, Washington. 
Well, Indonesian authorities are intensifying their effort to prevent further terrorist attacks in the wake of a last week's uh, deadly siege by Islamist militants. Viewers Brian Padden is in Jakarta and reports that despite warnings of possible future attacks, life in the Indonesian capital is quickly returning to normal. The Jakarta Starbucks coffee shop that was bombed is boarded up for repairs, and the memorial of flowers at the site is now gone. Traffic at the busy intersection in front of the Serena, the city's oldest department store, is again congested as usual. Eight people died in the attack, including four militants. Mohammed Yunus, an Ojek motorcycle taxi driver, has received widespread praise for his actions after the explosions and gunfire. After the second explosion, Yunus rushed to the police station to help a woman whose legs were severely injured, even though the assailants were shooting at anyone in the area. I got that woman and I told her, don't, please be strong, be strong. please don't be sad. Yunus said he found out later that the woman was with her nephew, who died in the blast. There have been demonstrations by Indonesian Muslims denouncing terrorism and calling for the government to eradicate radical militants linked to the Islamic State group that claimed responsibility for the attack. Indonesian President Joko Widodo said he will consider tightening the country's security laws to prohibit Indonesians from joining radical groups overseas. Critics say the government has been slow to act. The issue itself starting in 2013, 2014, but there is no result. It's not part of the government priority. The latest threat was a letter sent to police in Bali warning of an attack. Authorities advise visitors and residents of the resort island to stay alert and have increased security at shopping malls and other locations that draw crowds. Brian Patton, VOA News, Jakarta. Well, I want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we covered during the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. Check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCorry. Well, coming up, uh, challenging U.S. President Barack Obama's plan to defer the deportation of 4 million undocumented immigrants. Stay with us. news and notes. This is Living Better. Over here, odd kids eat and drink a whopping 5,543 sugar cubes. That's 22 bags of sugar. That's more than a kid like me weighs. That's from a British government campaign warning parents about the amount of sugar their kids are consuming. And the campaign offers a free smartphone app that scans barcodes of supermarket items to give an instant readout of the amount of sugar they contain. Dr. Alison Tedstone is with Public Health England. Children in Britain are eating far too much sugar, three times more than the recommended amount, um, and that's causing them real harm. Dr. Tedstone says almost half of Britain's eight-year-olds have tooth decay. A third of 11-year-olds are obese or overweight. Parents say the app is easy to use and helps demonstrate how much sugar is really contained in common grocery items. I'm Martin Seacrest for VOA's Living Better. I am Sheka Sali, host and senior editor of VOA's international calling talk show, Straight Talk Africa. Today we'll examine the tobacco industry. We pretty much touch on anything that you can think of. Politics, health issues, human rights issues, you name it, we talk about it. The issues that we discuss are pertinent to most people on the African continent. A very, very rare and unique opportunity to interact with their leaders. How do you see the world? I see countries in turmoil. I see our planet changing. I see people at peace. No matter how you see the world, you'll get an unbiased and uncensored view of it on Voice of America, on television, radio, online, and mobile. In more than 40 languages all day, every day, millions of people tune us in. How do I see the world? On Voice of America. The U.S. Supreme Court has decided that it will hear a case challenging President Barack Obama's plan to defer the deportation of more than 4 million undocumented immigrants 
and allow them to work legally in the U.S. Uh, President Obama's executive order is aimed at stopping the deportation of parents of American-born children and permanent residents. Here's VOA's Caroline Prasuti. This land was made for you and me, say these lyrics. This group says they will only ring true if the Supreme Court upholds President Obama's executive order. The justices will decide whether Obama has the power to shield more than four million undocumented immigrants from deportation and give them the freedom to work. Lower courts have ruled against the presidential order and the administration appealed to the nation's highest court. Three-year-old Kevin was born here and is legal. His mother, Brenda Barrios, is not. I am human. I have a rice in here. But the human aspect is not what the court will ultimately decide. Did the president violate the Constitution? Mark Krikorian with the Center for Immigration Studies says yes. This is actually the president making new policy by giving work permits and social security numbers and driver's licenses to millions of illegal immigrants. And that's a policy change that is reserved really only to Congress. The White House disagrees. It's a matter of, uh, of common sense and uh, you know, by consulting uh, recent presidential history. Uh, we feel confident that there is a strong precedent that exists. Meanwhile, at the Latino Resource and Justice Center, Kersen, employees are explaining the case to clients and getting their paperwork ready to prove they can stay in the U.S. Executive Director Avel Nunez says only vetted immigrants are eligible. They have to ensure that they haven't committed any crime because they, they'll get uh, FBI checks. They have to ensure that they file their taxes and be in compliant with every rule, regulation and law of the United States. Even if the justices rule in favor of the executive order, the win could be temporary. The new president elected in November or any future president could reverse it. In Washington, Carolyn Prasuti, VOA News. We're well, time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54, the stars of a much-anticipated film land on the front of a major fashion magazine. We'll be right back. If you've just joined us, I'm Maria Diallo, and here is a quick recap of today's headlines. In Kenya, police killed four men who were suspected of planning attacks on the city of Malindi. In Tunisia, hundreds of protesters demanding jobs in Kasserine clash with police during demonstrations following the suicide of a young unemployed man. In Nigeria, at least 76 people are dead in the Lassa fever outbreak, prompting the health ministry's call for an emergency meeting. Finally, in Malawi, the UN warns of a refugee crisis in that country with thousands of Mozambicans having fled from violence between government forces and the opposition. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. I'm Bill Arcega. I'm the host of VOA's The Correspondence, a roundup of the world's top stories with analysis from our dedicated reporters. It's really a conversation the same way that you would bring a friend to your home and ask them what's going on. In our correspondence, we'll do that and answer those questions through their own eyes. That appears a false choice in more ways than one. We can't actually put you there, but we can come pretty close. In 30 minutes, we'll show you the world.
Welcome back to Africa 54. I'm Esther Gidui Ewart, and here's what's trending. He's back. Supermodel Derek Zoolander and femme fatale Penelope Cruz have landed a prestigious bog cover shot by legendary fashion photographer Annie Leibovitz. Zoolander, who is played by actor Ben Stiller, leads a gang of fashion and Hollywood royalty in a very long-awaited sequel to the 2001 hit film called Of Course Zoolander. Are you ready for the return of Blue Steel? Let the walk-offs begin. Staying with the world of high fashion, embroidery is emerging as an early trend at Milan Fashion Week, with designers Dolce & Gabbana featuring needlework on denim jeans, jackets and shirts. An invitation to the show came with its own soundtrack, playing the theme to the 1964 Western A Fistful of Dollars when opened, repeating motifs of cacti, crossed revolvers, a mustachioned cowboy and a saloon dancer were embroidered or printed on sweaters and shirts as well as tailored jackets and three-piece and double-breasted suits. The designers call this collection Sicilian Western. And finally, oops, Rio 2016's official Twitter account hastily took down an animation promoting the upcoming Paralympic Games with former South African runner Oscar Pistorius. On its account, it published a message indicating that tickets were still on sale. The message said, click here to know which sport and, which, and with whom you will be watching the hashtag Paralympic Games with a 15-second animation showing pictures of athletes, their sports, and who would be the ticket holder's companion. To represent athletics, there was a picture of Oscar Pistorius accompanied by the message, with the love of your life. The tweet has since been deleted. And that's what's trending today, Vincent. Well, thanks a lot, Esther. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show, Africa News Tonight at 1800 UTC. And in the mornings today, break Africa between 0300 and 0600 UTC, Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching. From all of us in Washington, have a good night. To English in a minute. Butterflies are some of the most beautiful creatures in the world. The way they float along in the air is so lovely. But what does it mean to have butterflies? Let's see how to use this phrase in a conversation. Hey Anna, how did your presentation go yesterday? Oh, it, it went well, but I had butterflies in my stomach the whole time. Speaking in front of a large group of people like that always makes me nervous. To have butterflies means you feel nervous or excited about something. You might know the feeling of having butterflies in your stomach before a very important event. You can have butterflies before a big test, when you're on a first date, or like Anna, during a presentation. And that's English in a Minute.